My name is Joanna Wardlaw, and I'm presenting this guideline on covert cerebral small vessel disease on behalf of my colleagues in the module working group. These are my disclosures. This slide shows the 12 members of the module working group, all experts in the subject of small vessel disease. And we were fortunate to be joined by four guideline fellows who gave us enormous assistance and were absolutely instrumental in making sure that this guideline was completed. Several small vessel disease is a major clinical problem. It causes uh, around 25% of ischemic strokes and many hemorrhagic strokes. It's also a major cause of cognitive decline and dementia, gait and balance problems, and mood disorders. However, there is an increasing problem, which is covert small vessel disease, which is where the signs of small vessel disease are found on brain imaging in patients who have been scanned for some other reason and who do not have any clear history of stroke or a formal diagnosis of cognitive decline or dementia, mobility or mood disorders. But we know that these features of small vessel disease, such as white matter hyperintensities and lacunes, carry a significant increased risk of future dementia and also a future stroke. And so an increasing clinical problem is what to do about this. How can we help patients to prevent these future problems happening? Currently practice seems to be very varied and therefore our guideline working group decided to focus on covert cerebral small vessel disease for this first guideline. We undertook a detailed grade methodology approach and through that we selected, after we'd selected this patient group, we selected interventions, comparators and outcomes. The interventions that we chose to focus on reflected clinical practice. So stroke prevention, uh, such as antihypertensive, antiplatelet and lipid lowering agents. We also examined lifestyle interventions such as uh, smoking, cessation, weight reduction, exercise, dietary interventions, cognitive or social interventions. And we also chose to look at two other uh, interventions. One is glucose lowering agents, since diabetes is common, uh, commonly associated with small vessel disease, and also whether any conventional anti-dementia tre uh, dementia treatments might also be beneficial in small vessel disease. The comparator was the avoidance of any of these interventions or a less in intensive version of that intervention. And we focused on important clinical outcomes of stroke, cognitive decline or dementia, dependency, death, major adverse cardiac events, cardiovascular events or MACE for short, mobility problems, including falls and mood disorders, including depression. And so for each of the following sections, I will summarize what we found for each of these interventions in terms of their effect on each of these outcomes in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease. So each of the following sections has a similar layout. Uh, and here we summarize the evidence-based recommendations based on our distillation of a large literature. The literature that we were able to look at for each of these interventions is summarized at the bottom of the evidence-based recommendations slide as shown here. After looking at all of the available literature, our evidence-based recommendation was as follows. We recommend the use of antihypertensive treatment in hypertensive patients with cerebral small vessel disease defined as a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury to prevent the extension of small vessel disease lesions and related clinical outcomes such as stroke um, and future uh, clinical events. The quality of evidence was very low, but the strength of recommendation is strong. We also constructed expert consensus statements and we voted on each of these and the slide summarizes the strength of the voting within the group. So we all agreed that blood pressure should be appropriately monitored and well controlled and provided that blood pressure was well controlled, we do not advise any specific 
antihypertensive treatment. Most of us agreed that for patients with cerebral small vessel disease covert, there is currently insufficient evidence to systematically advocate targeting blood pressure levels lower than standard targets, although more intensive blood pressure lowering than conventional blood pressure lowering guidelines is associated with slower progression of white matter hyperintensities. We all agreed that in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease, in whom more intensive blood pressure lowering targets are recommended for other reasons, there is no strong evidence to suggest that this could be harmful. And on current evidence, we do not support systematic blood pressure lowering in normotensive covert small vessel disease patients. This statement is supported by information which is summarized in the guideline in some depth, but these points highlight key areas. Obviously, antihypertensive therapy is guideline for primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular events. Um, hypertension is known to increase the risk of dementia, and in several large systematic reviews, individual patient data meta-analyses, and so on, antihypertensive treatment may decrease cognitive decline in dementia or cognitive impairment risk if the patient's blood pressure is higher than 140 over 90 at the beginning, but not in patients who were normotensive. And we were able to conduct a meta-analysis looking at antihypertensive therapy and white, light, white matter hyperintensity progression specifically for this guideline. And that showed that trials in which an intensive lowering had been compared with standard lowering showed benefit in terms of preventing white matter hyperintensity progression, whereas trials which looked at a specific drug versus control had less evidence of benefit. Moving on to antiplatelet treatment, same construct of the next section as the previous section. So in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease, our recommendation is against antiplatelet treatment in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease as a means to reduce the clinical outcome events of ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes and the other outcomes that we were looking at. However, the quality of evidence is very low and our recommendation is weak against the intervention. Our consensus statement is that we advise against use of antiplatelet drugs, conventional antiplatelet drugs such as aspirin and clopidogrel to prevent clinical outcomes in subjects with covert small vessel disease when no other indication for this treatment exists, such as ischemic heart disease. With current available knowledge, the use of antiplatelet drugs to prevent progression of small vessel disease may be harmful in older patients particularly, if no other indication for this treatment exists. The information to support this comes from primary prevention, secondary prevention, um, and studies on um, other outcomes after uh, and with use of antiplatelet drugs. There's a large trial, uh, the ASPRI trial, which found no benefit of aspirin in people aged over 70, many of whom would be in the high risk population for having small vessel disease. There was no benefit in terms of vascular event reduction and increased risk of major hemorrhage and death from cancer. And of course, antiplatelet drugs are not recommended in primary prevention of vascular disease. There's a lot of evidence on secondary prevention um, antiplatelet drugs are guideline for prevention of recurrent stroke and ischemic heart disease. Um, but long-term dual versus single antiplatelet drugs were hazardous in lacunar stroke. Uh, moving on to lipid lowering, we did not find enough evidence of high enough quality on prevention of clinical outcomes in covert cerebral small vessel disease to make a definitive recommendation on lipid lowering. However, we recognize that lipid lowering is effective in primary prevention in those who are at high risk of vascular events. So the quality of evidence on this was very low, but it, our strength of recommendation is weak for this intervention. Our expert consensus statement, and here was the one topic where the group were most divided in their opinions, but we were narrowly in favor of lipid lowering with statins being considered in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease, even when no other indication for statin treatment exists. And this was with the aim of delaying progression of covert small vessel disease 
um, although the evidence on the clinical implications of delayed progression um, remain to be shown. The supporting information comes from a large body of evidence on primary and secondary prevention with lipid lowering agents, including in older people, uh, although there is as yet no evidence of any effect on cognition. Um, there are specific trials and there was a small amount of evidence which we meta-analyzed looking at lipid lowering uh, to prevent white matter hyperintensity progression, the results of which are somewhat mixed and this suggests that more data are needed. Um, lifestyle interventions. This was a huge subject, um, almost 3,000 papers to assess. Uh, on going through this and considering all of the interventions and our outcomes of interest, we recommend that in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease, physical exercise has beneficial effects on cognition and possibly also on mobility, on reducing the incidence of cerebrovascular events and death, and therefore recommend regular physical activity in general. However, we can't make any recommendations on specific types of physical intervention based on current evidence. The quality of evidence is very low, but the strength of recommendation is weak for intervention. In patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease, there is no evidence that other lifestyle interventions have beneficial effects on clinical outcomes. In terms of our expert consensus statement, we suggest that there's no direct evidence to suggest any specific lifestyle interventions to prevent clinical outcomes, but it's reasonable to promote healthy lifestyle interventions as recommended in primary prevention for vascular disease. The supporting information comes from primary prevention guidelines from numerous organizations. Um, we advocate physical activity, um, smoking cessation, and dietary and weight reduction. In terms of plasma gluco level, glucose levels, uh, we considered this both in patients with and without diabetes. And we consider that in patients with diabetes who may also have covert cerebral small vessel disease, we recommend the use of current guideline-based glucose-lowering therapies, guideline for diabetes, including recommended glucose and HbA1c targets as appropriate to the management of that individual patient's diabetes, um, with no recommendation for any particular glucose-lowering therapy for this purpose. Um, glucose-lowering in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease who do not have any indication um, for glucose control uh, should not be offered glucose-lowering. Um, we agreed that in pre-diabetic and diabetic patients with covert small vessel disease, that it was really important that the glucose levels should be appropriately monitored according to diabetes guidelines. Um, we can't advise any specific agent and there was insufficient evidence to recommend targeting specific glucose or HbA1c levels specifically because the patient had covert small vessel disease. And there was absolutely no evidence to support uh, therapeutic intervention to reduce normal glucose levels. Uh, there is supporting evidence from various Cochrane reviews and meta-analyses. Uh, in terms of conventional anti-dementia drugs, and these might include memantine, dinepazil, other drugs that are licensed for Alzheimer's disease, um, we suggest against the use of conventional anti-dementia drugs in covert cerebral small vessel disease as a means to reduce cognitive decline or dementia, the evidence is uh, low. Um, we considered that there was a lack of evidence for cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease. And there was limited evidence of benefit in patients who actually already had vascular dementia. And therefore we advise against provide prescribing these anti-dementia drugs in patients with covert cerebral small vessel disease um, we agreed that there was insufficient evidence for use of any other anti-dementia interventions in patients with covert small vessel disease. And this is um, our conclusion. So we advocate effective treatment of hypertension as per current hypertension guidelines, no specific drug, and lower BP targets may help reduce white matter hyperintensity progression. Not to use antiplatelet drugs unless there is another defined intervention for this treatment. Lipid lowering as per primary prevention, and there is no evidence of harm. Lifestyle interventions such as exercise and smoking cessation are exceptionally important. Diabetes should be managed as per current diabetes guidelines, 
and not to use conventional anti-dementia drugs. We noted that despite the commonness of covert small vessel disease and going through in excess of 8,000 papers in putting together this guideline, that there was a lack of trials in general for, for interventions for covert cerebral small vessel disease. And this needs to be rectified. In particular, there was a lack of clinical outcomes recorded in the trials which have been done. And we therefore strongly encourage the collection of clinical outcomes in any future trials in covert small vessel disease, no matter how small. There's a particular lack of data on mobility and dependency and mood outcomes, and this should be a focus of future work. Um, we provide some recommendations in our guideline as to future studies. We were not able to include microbleeds in this guideline due to uh, resource constraints and time, but both they and clinically overt small vessel disease such as lacunar stroke or vascular dementia will be covered um, in other guidelines. So I would like to thank the ESO guideline committee chairs, the editors and guideline reviewers for the European Stroke Journal, and the ESO office staff, Lucia Balmer and Sabrina Mutter for their enormous help in helping get this guideline together. Thank you.